individual done somewhere down, down in Texas. And I, it went on for days and days, so I called him up, and his wife asked her phone, I said, how's, I called him Pop, how's Pop doing? Oh, he's doing fine, he's doing fine. So said, okay, we'll tell him I called. I said, okay, bye. I kept, kept coming at me, and I called him again. He answered the phone, said, son, I've been sicker than I've been in a long time. But the Lord has touched my body, I'm feeling good. I, his wife didn't even know. See, your assignment has nothing to do with your ability. If God gives you the assignment, one scripture says, I study, it says, I'll make your feet like hind feet. One translation says, now don't watch, even in definitions, there are several definitions, depends on who you study, where you're studying from. This definition said, the I am that I am will put some I am in you, right. make you fitted for the task. Glory. You look like you were born to do what you struggle to do. With such grace. So I say I see the importance of much prayer, yet my life hardly leaves room for it. Is that real? Can, we, can I talk back to y'all? Talk back. To, I see the need for it, but is there much room for it? What are we to submit? That's the grace of yielding. Or tell us how we can attain to what we desire. I admit that the difficulty was universal. What? Everybody goes through it. Right or wrong. The first thing to your healing is to admit I need help. With drug addiction, for the, you can't just put a person in a, in a clinic for rehab. He got to want to go. He got to ask to go. I need help. I want deliverance from this. I'm tired. It's, it's, it's ruining my, I remember a thing on TV, a true story, a guy had an excellent radio voice. He's on a street corner begging for change. He said something to one guy who was an executive of a radio station. He heard it and said, man, you got the perfect voice. Wish, let's get together. Let's talk. And he got him back in, out in the game again. And his family heard about it. And they got angry at him because he left them. And he's in a hotel room somewhere in New York City. coming to do a, a, air, a TV show in New York. And they was in there fussing because why did you leave? But says, because I left you because of what I was going through would destroy you too. I didn't want to hurt the family. I didn't let it because I was irresponsible. He said, I knew what, somewhere, the same reason some parents give up a child for adoption. They said, if I don't give this child up, it's going to ruin this child. But it's hard for children to understand because they want their mom and daddy. This, that. But sometimes you, let me say this, it's crazy. Sometimes you better off without them sometimes. Sometimes what you're going through, you got to ask for help. And so it is a Dutch proverb. Dutch proverb. What is heaviest must weigh heaviest, must have the first place. The law of God is unchangeable as on earth, so in our traffic with heaven. We only get as we give. Unless we are willing to pay the price and sacrifice time and attention and what appears legitimate or necessary duties for the sake of the heavenly gifts, we need not to look for a large experience of the power of the heavenly world in our work. And in Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one he says, to keep the main thing, the main thing. Um, I won't expound on that any further. I'll move a little further in my lesson here. Blessed be God, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. You hear what he's saying? Uh, it's a term, uh, it's that El Shaddai. It's that El Shaddai. When God, it's the definition is God coming at you with all sufficiency. He's coming in your direction. He's moving like a freight train. Not to destroy you, but to bless you. He's going to change your life. He's going to uphold you. He's going to inspire you. He's going to help you. Do y'all believe that? Yes, Lord. Somebody say, I see some light at the end of the tunnel. And I hope it's not another train. <laughs> some people's life are like that. Uh... Do let us believe that God's call to much prayer need not be a burden and cause of a continual self-condemnation. He means it to be a joy. 
He can make it an inspiration, giving us strength for all our work and bringing down his power to work through us in our fellow men. Let us not fear to admit to the full, to full the sin that shame us, and then to face it in the name of our mighty Redeemer. The light that shows us our sin and condemns us for it will show us the way up, out of it into the life of liberty that is well-pleasing to God. A few weeks ago, it hit me hard. I said, God, we need more than this. We praying, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Remember so-and-so, uh, remember my mother, remember my brother. Uh, they got an ache, they got a back, they're sick. And we pray and pray and pray. But there's an unction that comes with an answered prayer. There's a confidence when you ask God, I believe God is going to answer. There's much needs. Things happen. I was studying today when a writer says in, in leadership, part of leadership is pain. Part of pain. Parents, for a moment, let's pause a moment. Parents, how many of you parents in here have experienced pain in raising kids? Well, you think you got it bad? Try my job. See, in your kids, you can look for a little bit of you in them. <laughs> but then we can look for a little of the other nature in us to lead us back to Christ. So then, if we allow this one matter, unfaithfulness in prayer, to convict us of the lack of in our Christian life, which lies at the root of it, God will use the discovery to bring us not only the power to pray that we long for, but the joy of a new and healthy life of which prayer is a spontaneous expression. You say, I need to go home and have a talk with God. Not shop for some shoes that match my outfit, I need to have a talk with God. I feel a need. There's, there's, there's something in your soul to tell you God wants to talk to you. And what is now the way by which our sense of the lack of prayer can be made the means of blessing, the interest on a path in which the evil may be conquered? How can our intercourse with the Father and continual prayer and intercession? Now, intercession, you're still communing with God. You hear me? You're still talking with God. You're praying for others. God made the assignment, but you have access. In intercession, God will call you to prayer, and while you're there, he'll tell you what to pray and how to pray. The same way when you pray for the Holy Ghost, and God gave you the Spirit, and you spoke in tongues. Now watch this. You didn't know the language. How many of y'all knew the language when you got the Holy Ghost? But you prayed, didn't you? You simply prayed unceasingly, right or wrong. And would you agree in some kind of way you could interpret what you were saying? Am I close? Am I close? And it was blessed, wasn't it? Your soul was saying, Lord, I love you. Lord, I want to live for you. I want to live my life. You're saying things that you couldn't say before you spoke. The same way intercession, God will give you the words to pray for individuals, for yourself, for your family, for your life. For the need that you have. Now, the need you have is not just the need that you have that you want. It's the need that you have that you were called for. Some things you don't even realize you were called for. You're searching, but you never came to the full understanding of what it was. Then the flip thing, when I found out what it was, I came and get the big head and think I'm better than everybody else. Us people got a certain level of spiritual insight, and you can tell them nothing. They, can, they became smarter than me. I paid for airfare, rental car, Hotel room and conference registration, they came on and thought they were smarter than me. What you going to do? You keep serving God. Yes. Amen. And so then, as it appears to me, we must begin by going back to God's word to study what the place is God and is God means prayer to have in the life of his chi child and his church. I'm going to show you a little bit in the scriptures. Every page you turn, the saints were praying because it was meeting something they couldn't handle. But today, uh, I think back a time when the best benefits we had was in the automotive industry. Now, who's here the oldest? Who can go back to furthest? When did, when, did, when did the automotive come to this area? Would you agree that was the best thing that happened to us? Would you agree, London? 
benefits. One of the greatest things in the, in the job industry was benefits. And when the writer said in the psalm, said, what shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits? And here's what happened. Our employers, in some cases, seem like they're offering us more benefits than God was. HMOs, PPOs, uh, psychiatric, uh, uh, family leave, ambulance care. What's some of the things? Dental care, right or wrong? Eyeglasses. False teeth, implants, hips, knees, backs, joints, psychiatric care, right or wrong? When what we had before was Jesus. Oh, Lord, come by here, Lord. Come by. He said, Lord, I, well, Jesus, would you please? I'm busy right now. I'm on a phone call. I'm trying to close a deal. I'm getting ready to buy a house. I, I think I got the woman in my dreams. I, I, got my, I got my groove going on. Please, Jesus, don't interrupt this. And so then, as we occupy ourselves with, the, with this and accept this teaching of God's word on prayer, we shall be led to see how our failures in the prayer life was owing to failures in the spirit life. We want to grow. How many of, us, how many of you really want to grow spiritually? Amen. How many of you have grown spiritually? You, can you mark it? With what you put in it? Is what you want out of it, or you want more? So that's a reasonable question. Have you put in what you expect to get out? Is that a fair question? What you expected from God, have you really put that in? To get along with God, you got to be honest. That's the beginning of growth. So nobody's answering today. You got to be honest. There's occasion I saw, I said, God, how can I love you if I don't love your word? The word was made flesh and dwell among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father full of grace. So, God, help me. Give me a love for you. I had to ask that question. I couldn't pretend to be spiritual. I've been saved so many years. I told a story when a friend of mine told me there was a meeting at the church, and, and, and it was going to deal with some, some deliverance. Now, if you're not ready for it, I've been a ministry for so many, now I'm ready, I'm ready, I, I can handle this. And when that demon got to act the fool, he was the first one to run. You gotta be honest with God. God knows your material. God knows you, and Satan knows you. He knows your button, he knows your secret sins. So with God, you gotta say, God, I need help. Not for me, but for my family's sake. Some things I begin to realize that God, I hear my grandson, I says, Lord, I don't recall holding our children when they were this small. But the Lord took me through a process and I learned something else. I couldn't expect God to be in my life like he was unless I did pray and fast. I can't repent from working for God, preaching, laboring in the ministry. I would, y'all would have missed a lot. Amen. But God didn't let my family suffer because I did. He, some of your things in your life, God watches over your house. Yes, God watches over your family. Yes. God protects your goods. All these things got on TV. You got insurance for your health, insurance of your your, your your deed for your house. All kind of crooks out there. But say, except the Lord build the house. They that labor, they labor. So God, I can't repent for praying and fasting and seeking your face and you blessing me and making me able. I can say, thank you for the grace. First, I was feeling kind of bad. I can't repent because I gave my life to God. I wasn't just on the spectators trying to get a good seat in the stands and watch the show. I was a part of it, being used by God. So I'm going to get to the main part. I'm talking about now the, the ministration of the Spirit in prayer, the ministration. Uh, Luke 1.13, 11.13. You have the microphone back there? Luke 11.13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? No. We don't use that when we pray for people with the Holy Ghost. We tell them that. If you ask God for the Spirit, he'll give it to you. I'm saying now, 
If you really want to get to know God on a personal basis, I ain't saying to lay hands on the sick and cast out demons and do miracles, just to hear his voice and guidance in shopping, housekeeping, in relationships. My wife and I have been married, what, 51 years, 51 years, I guess it is, in May 19th. I said to her, I said, honey, you need a break. Go see your sister in Savannah for a week. I understand that. Mary, I've seen what she's been through. Y'all don't see it, but I see it. She's taking care of me when I was sick. I took her to the airport this morning, bought her a ticket. Her sister came out and they flew to Savannah. Sometimes we need a break. Some not a break for a vacation in the airplane, but some a break in prayer. I said, okay, somebody need to take a, a, a week off, off of work, a sick leave to go pray. Your soul is hurting. Your soul is longing for a word from God. As I said before in my prelude, we pray enough to hold a position. Enough to make a difference. So the people that are following us, are they being spiritually benefited? Did you just teach a lesson or did you revolutionize their lives? So there's another scripture here. And, um, this is, uh, what is that right here? Luke 11 and 9. Luke 11 and 9. Amen. And I say unto you, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. So then God's giving is inseparably connected without asking. One scripture says it solves, delight thyself in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. It's a riddle. What the riddle is, if you delight in God, he'll tell you what to ask. If you're in the company of the, of the prince of Saudi Arabia and you just met him, you know what to ask or how to ask. You know what to ask. It's a good chance you'll get it if you know how to ask. Trying to impress him is not going to be good. You know how to ask. You're in the presence of God. You got to know how to ask. I preached a message a few months ago about touching God, the woman with the issue of blood. And I said, if God don't touch you, you can touch him. The different ways to touch God. And so then, the whole ministration of the Spirit is ruled by one great law. God must give and we must ask. When the Spirit was poured out at Pentecost with a flow that never ceases, it was an, an answer to prayer. The inflow into the believer's heart and his outflow in the rivers of living water ever still depend upon that law. What happened then must happen now. We must ask. We begin with the well-known words, amen, in Luke 1, 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Look back a little, back up a little bit. The story of the birth of the church and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the first freshness of his heavenly life and the power of that spirit will teach us how prayer on earth, whether as cause or effect, is a true measure of the presence of the spirit of heaven. We begins with the well-known words in uh, Luke 1.13 again. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. And then there follows, and they and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, one place, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And the same day there was added to them about 3,000 souls, and the great work of redemption had been accomplished. The Holy Spirit had been promised by Christ not many days since. He sat down on the throne and received the Spirit, but all this was not enough. One thing was needed. The 10 days... Uh, united continued supplication of the disciples. It was intense. Continue prayer. 
to prepare the disciples' hearts to open the windows of heaven that brought down the promised gift. Prayer will open the windows of heaven. Um, in our home, some people say, watch Doc, man, that's a, uh, I say this thing with reserve, that's a Baptist stronghold. I don't care if you're in a demon stronghold. You can open heaven. Get a response from God if the saints pray. There's places in Africa where demons were known to have power, witches, and so forth. One guy went there and began to pray as now is known the place of great deliverance. Sometimes we resign ourselves to enemy, but also sometimes your deliverance, watch this, your deliverance sometimes is tied to who God has connected you with. If you're in the right connection, your peace is brought because you're in the right place with the right person. As a pastor, I've gone through things. And God said to me, he said, this is my church. I set this church here to affect this community. And the people I saved, I saved them to be a part of the ministry to help minister and deliver in this community. But some have chose other things because they had other desires, but it's not according to what I had chosen for their life. He said, don't you let that bother you. He said, this is my church. And this church is not built on the income of a few people. I supply the jobs, the income, and the resources the church needs to carry out the ministry of Jesus Christ. Once I settled and said amen, guess what? And then the money began to flow again. Souls began to be saved again like in the early days when we first got saved. So it began to pastor. So sometimes we get caught up with who's who and what happened and what happened. So no, it's the test of our faith. So as Little as the power of the Spirit could be given without Christ sitting on the throne, could it descend without the disciples on the footstool of the, of the throne? For all the ages the law is laid down here at the birth of the church, that whatever else may be found on earth, the power of the Spirit must be prayed down from heaven. You hear that? Just lying before God. Watch this. If you got a job, want a job interview, a doctor's visit, if you spend the night before God, say, God, I need your help. I need your spirit to support and help me, God. You say, God, I need what? A better job. If I'm going to take care of this family, God, I need more money. I'm not praying about the money. I'm praying for your help. Whatever problem you're dealing with, say, God, I need your help. Won't he help you, somebody? The measure of believing continue. Prayer will be the measure of the Spirit's working. Hear that? In the church, direct, definite, determined prayer is what we need. Direct, definite, and determined prayer. You might just pray, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we need your help. You say, God, I'm tired of hurting. I'm tired of crying. I need healing, God. Something would happen, it was a, re a revelation of God's will could be what? that I was not the person that they wanted. Don't mean God reject you. It's not the purpose and the time. But as a human being, that is a major burden to carry when you have not been the one that you, you could apply for a job, but the people might have chosen you for the job. It doesn't mean God rejected you. It doesn't mean it's that God has a plan. So see how this is confirmed in chapter 4, I believe it is. Um, take it back. I talked about importunity. Our Lord Jesus thought it of such importance that he would show the need of perseverance and importunity in prayer, that he spoke two parables to teach us this. This is proof sufficient that it that this aspect of prayer we have at once. It is great difficulty and his highest power. He would have known, would have ever to know that in prayer. All will not be easy and smooth. We must expect difficulties, which can only be conquered by persistent and during prayer. I tell a story once a friend of mine, he was a real estate agent. He bought, he's trying to buy a piece of property. He kept running the, the walls and things stopping. And his wife said, honey, it must not be the will of the Lord. He said, no, that don't mean not the will of the Lord because you're having problems. He kept going. And finally, they, con they consummated a deal and bought the house. And she was a great attendant to take care of that rental property. Problem don't mean God is not in it. 
promises are a test of our faith. I remember the case I had a house I was trying to buy in, on the Oak Brook out there in Superior Township. And my buddy, real estate buddy came to me and said, uh, I got something for you that might be interested. I looked at it and I really loved the house. And I was talking to God in prayer about it. He says, let it go. I said, God, if I don't get it, I thank you. If I do get it, I thank you. So everything I got now, you gave it to me. I'm not become mad or disillusioned because I don't get it. I'm going to give you glory either way. I let it go. Somebody bought it. 365 days later, which is known as a year, he said, you won't believe this. The guy who bought it disappeared overnight. He moved out, and the house is back on the market again. Cheaper and less money down. And I know your whole process, but no need to say, I bought it. The Lord wanted to set it right for me. A denial is not a rejection. You hear that? A denial is not a rejection. Some of the Lord let things go to set us up. Amen. And so then we go a little further then here. Um, it is as if the story of Pentecost is repeated a second time over with the prayer, the shaking of the house, the feeling of the spirit and the speaking of God's word with boldness and power. And the great grace upon all the manifestation of the unity and love. To imprint it uh, upon the hearts of the church, it is prayer that lies at the root of the spiritual life and the power of the church. The measure of God's giving the spirit is our asking. He gives as a father to him who asks as a child. Then we find that when Mormons arose as the neglect of the Grecian Jews in the distribution of alms, the apostles proposed the appointment of deacons to serve the tables. What she said, we, they said, will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. It is often said the rightly, and rightly said that there is nothing in honest business when it is kept in its place as entirely subordinate to the kingdom which must ever be first and need prevent fellowship with God. So what happened in the process of ministry, we get caught up with stuff that will pull us from what God designed to build us up in. Uh, I had a plan. My plan was through real estate, prepare myself for retirement. I remember in Bible class back then, I had a pager. A pager would go off at property in Arbor, and the tenants would call, this, that, and the other. And Lord, let me know. This, he said to me, this is interfering with my purpose for your life. It was my plan. It was working well. Uh -oh. <laughs> and I had a call I had to attend to. So I had to say, I had to sell all my property and give myself to a greater dedication. That's what we Sometimes we pray enough to get what we want and we stop. And that's enough. But God wanted more. And that's the thing about the, the, the grace of yielding. I had to be willing to say, Amen. That the maintenance of the spirit of prayer, such as is consistent with the claims of much work, is not enough. For those who are the leaders of the church, to keep up the communication with the king on the throne in the heavenly world clear and fresh, to draw down the power and blessing. And that world, of that world, not only for the maintenance of our own spiritual life, but for those around us. Your call is not just for yourself, those in leadership. I to say, I might say, there was a poet and didn't know it. Some were a prophet and didn't know it. Didn't have words to speak in a timely manner. Didn't have words of encouragement, direction, or guidance to offer. The enemy is so, I watch him play games like playing chess. I watch your lives. Things bog you down, distract you. He does it intentionally. It's a game. I sit in Bible class. I see a phone ring. I see him leave, and they come back just when I get finished. It's a game from the enemy to distract from you. We can feel self-important because somebody called me, 
But some of those calls are meant to take you for God. God has a plan. So I know the thoughts I think towards you. Thoughts of good and not of evil. To have an expected end. The expected end is out here. And sometimes we're back here. Because we played into it. Our kids, our family, our car, things in our body. The things in our body is a test of our faith. So then, um, continue to receive instruction and empowerment for the great work to be done. The apostles, as the ministers of the word, felt the need of being free from other duties that they might give themselves to much prayer. James writes, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. If ever any work were a sacred one, it was that of caring for these Grecian widows. And yet, even such duties might interfere with the special calling to give themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Even as I contend presently, some have graciously been a blessing to me to go visit the sick and so forth and so on, people still expect me to show up at every event. Physically, I can't do it any longer. So I got to accept that. My call is to be constantly ready. I tell a friend of mine, say, you can't walk in Bible class with a bunch of notes on a piece of paper and haven't spent time with God. You got to find your source of feeding. Watch, if you go to a job that requires a lot, elder man, your mind got to be ready before you get there. You got to be steady, uh, done your math, figure out the people you got to deal with, ready to give an answer. And sometimes that requires prayer for that. You're not just punching parts. You're dealing with matters of the kingdom. Uh, so as on earth, so in the kingdom of heaven, there is power in the division of labor. And while some like the deacons have specially uh, to care for serving the ta tables and ministering, the alms of the church he on earth, others had to set free for that steadfast continuous in prayer, which would uninterruptedly secure the downflow of the power of the heavenly world. So this downflow is happening constantly. But the question is, who is in line to receive it? Who is the word of life? As the Lord saved new people, we say, work in Messiah's temple and that's it, you're going. I remember the occasion they would take you places to revivals and meetings and prayer. You know, we got Bible class tonight. We got prayer tonight. The fellowship of the brothers. They, they don't know all that stuff. This is something that's in, in our, like being in high school, I say. Going from junior high school to high school, which degree is intimidating. When my kids were in school, I knew the feeling. And I forgot it. So I take them to school before school began. We found their lockers. We found their classrooms. We met their teachers. If they didn't know before they started, they can walk in there with confidence. Same way in church. When people, you give them an outline for the services, that outline means nothing. They got to be shown, nurtured, mentored, and encouraged. And they did it for us, but we don't remember that. I do remember it. The minister of Christ is set apart to give himself as much to prayer as to the ministry of the word. And faithful obedience to this law is the secret of the church power and success. As before, so after Pentecost, the apostles were men given up to prayer. Um, so for a moment we see here, let's see what my note says here. The key is what is being made whole. Not just to perform, but to carry out the work of God. Amen? And so then... Uh, As Samaria, Philip had preached with great blessings, and many had believed, but the Holy Ghost was as yet fallen on none of them. The apostles sent down Peter and John to pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. I'll pause a moment here. My point being here is this. Uh, as we turn the pages, one event after the other, they were praying. Get the picture. They just pray to bless their food. They didn't pray to bless, bless the service. Right now, we're praying for the state meeting next week. Uh, one of the saints came and asked me to do prayer. I said, have you communicated with the rest of the congregation our strategy in prayer? 
Well, no, that ain't, that's not good enough. You got to put it out there. When the prayer is, they want to pray around the clock. I haven't heard much communication. That's what I'm doing. I'm not trying to embarrass them. I'm trying to tell you, in order for us to survive, we've got to pray. Not when it's convenient. So for you to ask God, let me put it as a priority. So watch, if God wake up 3 o'clock in the morning, there's probably a good reason for it. Wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning, there's probably a good reason for it. If you can't sleep, there's probably a good reason for it. So as Samaria, Philip had preached with great blessings and many had relieved. The power for, for such prayer was a higher gift than preaching. The work of the men who had been in closest contact with the Lord in glory, the work that was essential to the perfection of the life of that preaching and baptism, faith, and conversion had only begun. Surely all the gifts of the early church for which we should long, uh, there is none more needed than the gift of prayer. Prayer that brings down the Holy Ghost on believers. This power was given to the men who say, we will give ourselves to prayer. Now, during the pandemic was a very special time, believe it or not. We were locked in right or wrong. People were not fellowshipping. The malls almost died. The church was very sparse and seating. People was afraid to come out. Wasn't that a good time to pray, y'all? One thing God taught me, right, the times of peace is God gives you to build your spiritual house. Not to see what's on Netflix and Hulu and Prime and Direct TV and what's all the other shows they got out there. At a certain point, a heart should be burdened to say, I haven't given myself to seeking God rather than watching eight hours of TV. In the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the house of Cornelius, it's another prayer again, right? Uh, what did the last chapter go to? Let's see. Uh, That was in St. John 5, 6, and 9. Let's go there for a moment. 5, 6, and 9. Jesus said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. Jesus said to him, Rise and walk. Immediately the man was made whole and walked. Acts 3, 6, in verse 16, Peter said in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The faith which is in is by him hath given this man this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So here he's asking us, amen, to call on that name. People around us, they need somebody in our midst. There's a power to call that name. And Lundy will tell you, remember Lundy was in Cairo, Egypt? And there was a primary Islamic population. Uh, a church building was kind of a weird setting. The men sat over here, and the women sat over there. And we and the saints thought they were modest, elder, but these women had on black, covered their face up, had on black gloves, a dress down to their wrists, they hit the ground, and they weren't even professing to be sanctified. But they stood in line the church. They had me corner in the corner, saying in their own language, touch me here, touch me there. I have, I have this, I have that. Please pray for me. They wanted somebody that had the power to deliver. But in America, we become secret. We don't really want to say what ails us. One occasion, I brought a man to preach here one time, he, and I was sick then, probably sicker then I am now. And he took quite a while to get to his point. My body becoming wearied. I said, it's time to go. And one of the ministers said to me, when you cut that prayer meeting, my wife had to go to emergency next morning. And I said, so I had to go to dialysis next morning. So what? I haven't stopped since then. I can't accuse that one service. God has my healing where he has it at. I can't blame you or no preacher for God not healing me because the service didn't go long enough. That was a pretty... Pretty mouthy to say it to me anyway that when you cut that service, my wife had to go. My wife had to go to emergency plenty. I never told y'all about it. I just went, God ministered, and we went on back home, right or wrong. But the gift of prayer, somebody here has been appointed by God with a grace in their hands and their life 
to pray. Somebody prayed for them, gave them the cloth, and they'd been all over town with that piece of cloth. One person called me this morning, I said earlier, they asked me for a cloth. I didn't give it, never give it to them. I haven't found a person trying to pray for yet. But there's power just in your words. So to Philip of Samaria, the revival started, but the Holy Ghost didn't fall until Peter and them came down to lay hands on them. Because they knew the power of God. And the Bible says, when Jesus spoke to Peter, he gave him the keys to open up the door to the church. And that was the opening when the Spirit fell and the Holy Ghost filled them. And so it is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the house of Cornelius at Caesarea. We have another testimony of the wondrous inter interdependence of the action of prayer. The interdependence means, this young people don't realize, the greatest level in life is not independence, it's interdependence. It's working together with others for greater outcome. Uh, somebody say, I want to get out of my mom's house, I want to be independent. There's one thing you want interdependence. People working together for the same cause. As you work toward it, the, the attack of the enemy is going to come. Anybody in leadership, whatever level you're at, attack is going to come. The most hurts you will experience in life is in leadership. It's going to come at you. Don't shock yourself. You're going to cry. You're going to go, why God? Why this? Why this? Going. That's where you get to know God is in your sufferings. He learned obedience by the things he suffered. And so then, um, Peter went up at midday to pray on the housetop. And what happened? He saw heaven, hope, heaven open, and there came the vision that revealed to him the cleansing of the Gentiles. So what it was, now watch, culturally speaking, there was a caste system in place. The Jews have nothing to do with the Gentiles. They were called unclean. I read somewhere, I was studying with the Jewish background, some Jews said God created the Gentiles to flame the fires of hell. That's very nasty, isn't it? They believe that that's strong. The only thing was certain foods they didn't eat. They felt that was being holy by keeping the law. But the Lord didn't want Peter now to break a cycle. The other cycle he broke when he says, uh, when the Jews would not receive the Gentiles through the church until God gave them the Holy Ghost. Can man, the Bible says, can a man forbid these things? The Lord has given them the, the spirit as well as we. God does stuff to cleanse our thoughts. We have thoughts that are not of God. The people that God want to help, you think they ain't qualified. And God said, you're not even qualified. I said, I qualified you. You weren't ready, but I made you ready. Right. And so it goes on to hear an outline we'll talk about again. With, this, with that came the message of three men from Cornelius, a man who prayed always and heard from an angel. Now he watched people say, God don't hear a sinner's prayer. That's a lie. How do I know? He heard the prayer of Cornelius, who was a sinner and a Gentile. And the Bible says, pray before God as alms. And said to Peter, rise, Peter, sleep, go down to Cornelius' house. And thy prayers are come up before God. And when the voice of the Spirit was heard, saying, go with them, it is Peter, it is Peter praying to whom the will of God is revealed, to whom guidance is given as going to Caesarea, and who is brought into contact with a praying and prepared company of hearers. No wonder that in answer to all this prayer, a blessing comes beyond all expectation. And the Holy Ghost is poured out upon the Gentiles. A much praying minister will receive an interest into God's will he would otherwise know nothing of, will be brought to praying people where he does not expect them. Some of our contact come what? From God leading us to someone that has a hunger but hasn't told us yet, but God knows the hunger. I might ask a simple question. How many here had a hunger before God before you met God? Somebody stopped you? Somebody witnessed to you. Somebody said something and made you wonder what manner of message is this. And so then, um, it 
it will receive a blessing above all they will ask or think. The teaching and the power of the Holy Ghost are like unalterably linked to prayer. So this person, Cornelius, was unsaved, but he's praying and God heard his prayer. I'm asking a question. I'm going to throw it out there. Anybody here has had any outstanding prayers answered recently? What? Remember I asking? Yeah. Oh, for my children to be saved. Yes. I'll tell you about Marion's son. He was highly offended by brought him some strange doctor. He got mad. Some of the older saints are eating that mess up. Because he knew it wasn't according to what he believed. Anybody else? Had a prayer. God answered for you. I'm trying to show the point that God does hear. I believe today, sitting here now, I said to Sister Bosick, I think it was Sister Bosick, I want to have a conference on prayer, and I don't want to just talking about it. I want us praying for deliverance, for souls to be set free. Amen. Was your hand raised? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. But again, Brother Maurice, it's not a secret. We all have needs. But some of us have had that need. I mentioned in the early part of the discussion, have grown beyond having just enough. Now we got something in the bank. Some of us barely made it spiritually, but some of you are abounding in grace. But who are we dispensing it to? Do you do it in gold chains and diamond rings or wearing it around your neck or are you handing it out? It's the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. Be blessed. And I keep asking Brother Maurice and Maurice, what greater things, right, do you expect from God? What is greater? We want more of. But as we begin to ask, we begin to recognize, watch this, Maurice, that something we're going to be asking for is going to interfere with what we have now. That's when it calls for the grace of yielding. You can't see now how you're going to do what you, what's to come. But it's going to require what? A greater measure of wisdom. So then next we have uh, the story of Peter in prison. On the eve of execution. That's pretty intense, ain't it? The death of James had aroused the church to a sense of real danger. And the thought of losing Peter too, waking up all his energies. If he took himself to prayer. And I'm, watching, I'm, just, I'm just turning the pages in the book of Acts. One page. Saints are praying right or wrong. It was not an anniversary. It wasn't a convention. It wasn't a, what, a, a conference. It was a way of life. They prayed and they prayed and they prayed. If they didn't all pray, somebody prayed. Amen? Amen? So do we have any tag teams going on here today, y'all? We sing, saints don't stop praying, for the Lord is nigh. Saints don't stop praying, he'll hear your cry. For the Lord is promised, and his word is true. Saints don't stop praying. Now, importunity, watch this, this right here. You may have a cousin that's not saved, but they can pray too. Amen. You ain't got to be just all your Holy Ghost field, carrying red badge, carrying saints, missionary, international, so forth. You can be a regular old person that says, God, I need your help. Yes, Lord. I'm facing a life sentence, God, and I want to change God. I've been a shot caller, kingmaker, but now I'm a broke down child and need deliverance. Amen. So one reference I have here, I'm going to make, a, make my reference I have here. And it got to be this right here, that God, watch, 
will hear me. And here a scripture point Isaiah 30, verse 18 and 19. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. Blessed are all they that wait for him. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer it. I the song go, I was sinking deep in sin. Far from the peaceful shores, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. What? But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters he lifted me, now safe am I. What he said, but he said, I was very deeply. Stay, that's importunity. Yeah. Staying within, yeah. sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea. The Lord will hear when we call upon him. I have called upon thee, for thou will hear me. Are y'all confident of that? Yeah. Because he don't answer, don't mean he didn't hear you. So it's, it's a test of our faith. Okay, where are we at now? Let me go back here for a moment. So, with Peter in jail. Stone walls and double chains, soldiers and keepers, and the iron gate all gave way before the power from heaven. That prayer brought down to his rescue. The whole power of the Roman Empire, as represented by Herod, was impotent in presence and of power. The church of the holy wielded in prayer. I have, that's the 12th chapter of Acts. Remember clearly, guys, it's studied number 12, 12, 3 times 4, so forth. And Herod sat on the throne, but the saints ruled by prayer. How many of y'all ruling today? They stood in such close and living communication with their Lord in heaven. They knew so well that the words, all power, is given to me. And lo, I am with you always, were absolutely true. They had such faith in his promise to hear them whatever they ask. That they prayed in the assurance that the powers of heaven could work on earth and will work at their request and on their behalf. The Pentecostal church believed in prayer and practiced it. Let me tell you one, Brother Owens here today, you remember me telling the story. We was putting together a thing for the church. We put together our online presence. When those cameras back then were about seven thousand dollars, I said, "Brother Owens, let's go on the altar and get on our knees." Remember that, Ryan? Yes, and he actually got on his knees, <laughs> and we prayed. Within a couple of days, right, Brother Owens, a young saint in their twenties came to me and brought us a check for four, right, fourteen thousand dollars. So the Lord told me to do this. I don't know why I'm doing it, but here's the check. Ryan said, now I believe anything. <laughs> yeah. They bought the check and gave it to him. said, the Lord told me to give you this check for $14,000. That's one. One of many stories, right? And right now, he and I have learned we can pray as we went. <laughs> and the Lord did that thing. <laughs> But the goal is to pass it on. Yeah. The church with power. Yeah. Um, it's something we pray in a unified manner. I think, let me look at my clock here. I think I've hit my mark. But I'm gonna, I had in mind to do something today. I'm going to do two things. One, uh, my wife told me she had talked to Sister Lundy and requested prayer, very serious prayer. And Lundy came to me bits and pieces. But my wife is more detailed. But she needs prayer. And early as a pastor, the Lord said to me, he said, watch, Owens, he said, you got a problem. He said, they're thinking you, you are me. And you don't want that in your life. So I'm going to help him. He knew I was ignorant. I know what's going on. Because when God keeps answering your prayer, people think you're the one answering them. Everything I said, it happened. Somebody said, I was getting angry at you. They said, every time I 
needs you, you showed up at my door. The Lord let me do it. He said, but you got a problem now. I'm going to help you. But you call a prayer meeting on a Monday night. Remember that Monday? I called a prayer meeting on a Monday night, and almost the whole church showed up. So Lundy was due to go in for a biopsy or something, right? She had cancer. And that night in prayer, didn't God heal her? Yeah. I just one day on the phone, he has a problem with that. They face it, drooped or something. I said on the phone, my phone, he wanted me to see him. I said, let me tell you something. I says, my daughter would tell you I've had several strokes. I was in with her in Carolina. She was an airline student for Delta Airlines. She lived in uh, Carolina. Was that same place as Duke is at. Where's Duke at? Charlotte. And I went to see her. My wife and my, we were supposed to go see her, but their flight was delayed. So I said, I ain't seen no air put all in So I went anyway. And while I was there, I had a stroke. I was on the floor. I woke up. My mouth was tingling. I had no control of my hands. I said, Maya, I think I'm having a stroke. Take me to the hospital. I got my Apple phone out. And if I'm a director of the Duke Hospital, I walked in and said, I think I'm having a stroke. And they set me down. They come in a hurry. And they said, I think he is. They took my blood pressure. And my body was going through changes. So I came to the ambulance. I said, I'm here, aren't I? They gave me some stuff called TPA. They said, oh, my God. I heard him talk. I said, oh, my God, it's working already. They saw the changes immediately. But what they gave me, I had to stay in the ICU. It was Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and day after Christmas, I was in the ICU. I came home from the hospital in a wheelchair because of my condition, and I never saw the effects. I did. Since then, I had a, a numbness in this finger right here. I can't get rid of it. That's my sign to remind me that God is shot up. God is faithful. And May 19th, I forget what year it was, John Slaughter was getting married in this church. My wife and I went out to breakfast that day to celebrate. It was our anniversary the same day. I came home from the garage. I have a half bath off from the garage. I went to the bathroom, and the ground felt like a magnet. It sucked me to the ground, and I couldn't get up. I got up again, and I fell again. We called an ambulance. I was in the hospital, and I could not even do his wedding. They tried to find what's wrong with me, and the Lord healed me again. I can't tell you the trauma my body has been through, but God has been a deliverer and a healer. And they love me. We're going to pray for a proxy for you, for your wife. Just come on, get a seat right here, please, sir. Lundy, we're going to pray for, for Mayor right here. I'm going to share something with you. I'm going to share something. Quick, quick, quick. Before we start, I'm going to share something with you. When Bishop Thornton was here, here's what happened. He called a prayer line. Some of y'all started your own prayer line. Please don't do that, y'all. I'm asking God for direction. He told me what they're going to do. But also, when London get finished, I look at somebody in here right now that needs a breakthrough spiritually. That needs God to do something. I'm not denying it, but I'm trying to tell you. I don't know, it may look like I'm doing that. I'm in a conversation with God, ask him what to do and what to say. They talk to me about it, but sometimes we, we in the modern day world, when I come along, everybody told all